Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, he was a former Washington Post reporter with nine books to his name, but his tenth would be the hardest to write because it was about his own son who has a mental illness. A conversation with best-selling author Pete Early about his book, Crazy, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. What is it like to have your mind go through a storm? Well, at least one in five Americans has some idea because that's how many people have a mental illness. And when you add in all the people trying to help, like parents, diseases of the brain affect many more. Pete Early is one such parent, a former reporter for the Washington Post. He's the author of 13 books, including Hot House, Life Inside Leavenworth Prison, Family of Spies, Inside the John Walker Spy Ring, and WITSEC inside the Federal Witness Protection Program. But he would face his greatest challenge trying to go inside the mind of his own son, who has a mental illness. Early faced roadblock after roadblock as he tried to navigate the system that was ostensibly set up to help his son, a system that often seemed more like a labyrinth. Ultimately, he used his reporting skills to try and make sense of it all. The resulting book, Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2007. And as we'll hear, writing the book changed Early's life. Now, Pete Early is in Boise to speak to the Idaho chapter of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And thanks to that organization for finding time in his schedule for this interview. Welcome. Thank you. It's, I'm thrilled to be here. You're, you're well known in mental health services oh. because of what you've done. So thank you. Well, thanks just for explanation. We've done a, several documentaries here on the right. subject of yeah. mental illness. And it's a subject that I think is a very important one. As I mentioned, touches so many people. And you've been to Idaho before. I've you've been here five times, actually. I've come out once before to Sandpoint to talk to a National Alliance on Mental Illness group, but also to your judges. They invited me out, which you have a progressive state. Uh, I know that people sometimes get frustrated and say, you, we need to do more, we need to do more. But I've been to 48 states, three different countries. And I'm telling you, Idaho is doing, it's, it's, it's doing, it's doing, it's doing well. Could it do better? Absolutely. Well, we'll talk about that. And we actually um, have a, a woman who, like you, has gone public with her situation with her son, Liza Long. She's been right. on Dialogue before. Faced a lot of stigma for, for coming forward and talking about her fear of her own son in the wake of the Newtown shootings. You're familiar with her story, yes? Oh, absolutely. We testified together on Capitol Hill. And I must put a caveat on what I just said. My son had a breakdown. If he had lived in Idaho, the chances are, according to a recent study, five to one that he would have ended up in jail or prison instead of getting help. Five to one. So while Idaho's making progress, that's nothing to brag about. Can you imagine that for a heart attack? You have a heart attack, five to one, you'd end up in jail? Doesn't make sense. Now, she faced some criticism for going forward with her yeah. story and her blog. Um, with this book, again, this wasn't exactly a no. publisher's marketing dream to write a book about having a mentally ill son, was it? No, and it was very difficult for me as a reporter. Um, I'm, I'm old enough that I still believed in their tradition and not being yeah. part of the story. And when I wrote the first version of this book, quite frankly, the editor, it's the only book I've written, the editor said, we can't publish this. And I said, why? And they said, there's no, you have all these different pieces. And only when I became the central character and take you on a journey with me through the system do you understand and pull it all together? So, so it was awkward. And it, I changed. Actually, my son's real name, he's come out of the mental health closet, is Kevin. His middle name was Mike. But I couldn't type the words Kevin without tearing up. And so I used his middle name as for me and also as a thin veil. But now he's, he's open about it, as yeah. you said. Uh, but again, when you first approached publishers, uh, some of them seemed interested but then backed away, right? Absolutely. Once they're marketing department took a look at Yeah, they said, look, this is a downer. Uh, we don't, and, you know, there's there's no market for this. And uh, nobody really wants to read about mental illness, and especially 
people who end up in jails and prisons. Uh, they want it to go away, uh, and, and it's typical of how the public reacts. When you see someone who's psychotic on the street, you're afraid, you want to blame that person. You don't want to believe that this is a real illness, because if it is, then it could happen to somebody you love. And so they react, oh, they, they're lazy, they're bum, they have, a co they have a drug or alcohol problem. They deserve to get this, because then it makes you feel better about yourself. But actually, there was a market for the book. People did read it, and yeah. it was uh, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, that surprised me. The other two books were both about the war in Afghanistan. So it showed, it, it, it wasn't so much my writing skill. What it showed me was that this is really, and people come up to me and say, you wrote my book. And every audience I talk to, everyone I talk to, Marcia, there's people there who have worse stories than I do. It was your wife who encouraged you to write this yeah. book. Uh, we'll talk about what was happening with your son in, in a moment, but she... She said, do what you do best, right? Yeah, I actually listened to her for a change. <laughs> and what I discovered was that she said, a father, you can't find out much. A journalist, you can. And that's when I discovered that, um, you know, that there was this huge population of people who had moved from state institutions uh, into jails and prisons, and then people like my son who followed them because of a lack of good community care. And jails and prisons are our new asylums. It's true in Virginia. It's true in Idaho. So your son, Kevin, right? Uh, he, like many other people, including ones I've interviewed, um, developed some symptoms just past the age of what we call majority right. when he was in college. Yep. And describe describe the symptoms to people who may have well, children the, or grandchildren that yeah, age. Yeah, you know, it, it often surfaces in the 20s, and my son was in college. His first thing was he said food didn't taste well. And uh, he started telling me he, he thought he took some homeless people to breakfast, but he couldn't remember if he did or not. And so I raced up to see him. We got him to see a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist, Marcia, so the psychiatrist came out and said, if you're lucky, he has a drug problem. If you're unlucky, he has a mental illness. Well, I thought, well, what's this guy know? And he gave him some medication. He took it for a while. I thought it was like aspirin. You got a headache. You take the aspirin. It goes away. And then a year later, he had a major breakdown. And he, his brother called me and said, um, Kevin's crazy. You got to do something. You got to come here. And then I went and I got him. And he was. Um, he he was, had been walking the streets of Manhattan for five days. He hadn't slept. He was convinced God had him on a special mission. And I drove him from there to Fairfax County, Virginia, outside of Washington where I, I lived, and I took him to an emergency room. Where else would you go? And uh, during that ride, he asked me, he said, Dad, how would you feel if someone you love killed himself? And he would laugh one minute and then sob the next. And see signs everywhere yep. in bumper stickers. And he was getting messages, a dog, God, reversed, laughing. You know, this were, and that was not, it, it, it was very, since I've gotten more experience with this, Feeling like you're talking to God or special with God, this is kind of a, 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 a symptom you see over and over, you know, grandiosity, this hallucination. But what you encountered in the hospital setting was what, of course, all the people in right. the documentaries that I did encountered as well, Absolutely. which they said... He's not a danger, not a danger himself or others. We sat there for four hours in a room alone, and I literally had to grab a doctor and bring him in. And he said, look, your son has already told us he thinks pills are poison. And, you know, you've been here four hours. He's not a danger. And literally said, if you want to get him treatment, you have to bring him back when he's so violent, he he's threatening to kill you or someone else. I took him home. I watched him. At one point, he had tin foil wrapped around his head. He was watching TV because he was afraid the CIA Common was reading as his well thoughts. To yeah. Wrap yourself in tin foil. Yeah. yeah. He, he slipped out of my house early one morning. He broke into a stranger's house. Luckily, no one's there. He broke in to take a bubble bath. Five police officers get him out of there. Uh, they took him to a community mental health center. I went racing over. A policeman actually was standing outside. He said, Listen, even though he's told us he has bipolar disorder, he's told us off his meds, we picked him up in a house, taking a bubble bath. Unless you tell him he's threatened to kill himself, we can't do anything. Or hurt you. Yep. Threatened to hurt you. And we're going to take him to jail. And you don't want that. You don't want him in jail. To get him in a hospital, you got to tell him he's a danger. And so it hurt my relationship with my son, but I went and I lied. I said my son had threatened to kill me. That was good enough. 24 hours later, he voluntarily admitted himself. 24 hours after that, our insurance company wanted to throw him out. And they said, you know, we're not going to pay for this. He's not dangerous. So these laws, which is, exist as well right. in states like Idaho, that d Absolutely. you need to be in imminent danger to yourself right. or, or others, 
those are kind of an outgrowth, or they are an outgrowth, of what you write in your book is almost a, a warping of an original civil right. rights movement. That's the right. civil rights movement to help patients get treatment when right. they needed right. turned into uh, advocacy on behalf of patients to be able to refuse treatment. That's absolutely right. You stated it perfectly. What happened was in the 1960s, the civil rights movement moved into mental health and it really needed to. It shouldn't be against the law because you're hearing voices. You shouldn't have somebody pick you up and throw you in an institution. And these were often institutions where it was a life sentence. You couldn't get out right. because nobody knew how to help you. And so you were locked up forever. You might have somebody shove an ice pick up under your eyelid and scramble the front part of your brain, and give you a lobotomy and say, guess what, you're cured, congratulations. And so so civil rights lawyers came in and they said, look, uh, you shouldn't be arrested because you have mental health. It shouldn't be against law. You should have a right to refuse treatment. Who wants an ice pick shoved up your eye? And also they said, we want to make it, these places are so horrible, we're going to make it almost impossible to force anyone. Some of these lawyers didn't believe in commitment. You have to be in immediate imminent danger to yourself or others to take your rights away. And you know, the Cuckoo's Nest uh, movie had come out, it had a huge impact, and people got behind that. And a judge ruled that a guy who had chronic schizophrenia who was sleeping under a car, eating his own feces at night, was not a danger to himself or others. And so this is where that standard got set. I think and, it's a false standard. I'm sorry? I fault, think it's a false, a false standard. standard. You would prefer to see a standard that is uh, treatment-based. I would like, I, what I'd like to see is what's called a, a need for treatment. Mm -hmm. And we are behind the rest of the world on this. Um, first of all, I don't think dangerousness is something anybody can predict. I had a friend who was coming back with her son from a psychiatrist appointment. They stopped on the Verrazano Bridge. He got out of the car, jumped off, and killed himself. I mean, who knows who's going to be dangerous, you know? So I think that's a false standard. I understand the need for protection. England, France all have need for treatment. What they do is they recognize someone is not acting the way they normally act. There's something going on. And then they have safeguards built in to protect that person from being thrown into an institution, if, even if you have an institution left. So I believe that's better, a need for treatment, rather than waiting for someone to become dangerous. Because some people never become dangerous. And we have to say that, again, going back to this age of majority, what happens yeah. is a lot of parents run up against that 18-year-old right. age where they cannot intercede anymore. Right. They're not part of the process. Right. And you would also like to see parents be able to be brought back in. I think parents should be partners in the process, not seen as the enemy. And for a long time, schizophrenia was blamed on mothers. Now you're seen as this pest, you're part of the problem. You gotta remember that according to the National Institutes of Mental Health, about 40% of people, when they're in a psychiatric crisis, don't think anything's wrong with them. They think there's something wrong with you. And as the parent, you recognize it, so you try to take them in, you're automatically the enemy. What's really tragic is, that the system itself makes you the enemy too. The attorneys represent the uh, patient and, right. and, and advocate and that, for their yeah. And that, the, the you know, defenders. everybody deserves a legal representation. But you understand, I mean, you and I talked before the program about some of the side effects of these medications. They can right. make you lethargic, they can make you gain a lot of weight. Right. Uh, you understand why some people would not want to take the medication. Absolutely. But that's, see, we're thinking in terms of medication being equated with treatment. And that's because we know that medication in our country, the medical model with medication, has traditionally helped most people take care of their illnesses. But we have to think outside the box. We've got to realize that there is not one cure for one specific, all of us are different. It's just like medications are different. My son was on a medication turned him into a zombie. So, of course, he didn't want to take that. The problem is, is, the problem is we only look at medications, and the problem is that we say to psychiatrists, look, I, my son's had seven psychiatrists. Only two have known anything about him besides his name and his diagnosis. Why? Because we're only going to pay him for 15 minutes. And so my job is to figure out what pill to stick in your mouth. Okay, you're bipolar. Ah, here comes Zyprexa, open wide, and let a cheaper social worker. So the whole system is designed around that model. Instead of taking time to learn someone, get to know them, find out what they really might need, and give them a good medical uh, examination and and help them find, the, if medicine's the answer, the right medicine with the least side effects. And maybe that would be going to a community mental health center and, and having those, all those wraparound services there. I know that right. as we speak, 
um, our governor is uh, recommending that we you know, have some three treatment centers like that around look, the state. My, my story is really about after my son was in the hospital, he got charged. He was arrested. And I was outraged because I discovered that right now, as Marcia, as you and I are talking, there are 365,000 people with schizophrenia and bipolar in jails and prisons. There are a million on probation, a million go through the system. And in Idaho, the largest public mental facility in your state or not your two state hospitals, it's your state prison system. Your state prison system has about 7,500 inmates in it. Uh, I think 9% of those, the last figures I saw, have a mental illness. That's about 700 people with serious, not people who are just, gee, I'm depressed. Them in prison, serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. I think your two hospitals together uh, have a third of the beds of that you have in your state prison. In other words, you got 600 people in state prisons who have serious mental illness. You have maybe so 200. Or, or, no, state prisons. Oh, state you got 600, that, 600, okay. about 600, 700 people with serious mental illness in your state prisons. Your two hospitals combined have about a third, about as many beds. And we should say we're talking about state hospitals now, right. so in Blackfoot and Orofino right. as opposed to the private hospitals. Right. Well, let's let's expand on this. I know your book is both about your personal story right. and also as a journalist, as a reporter, you wanted to go out and look right. at the larger issue. You chose Miami-Dade County to go down because there's a, a judge down there who's worked on this assiduously. And you visited what's known colloquially as the forgotten floor right. of the jail there, the right. ninth floor. Yeah. Even just reading it, even without the visuals, and Michelle Gillen, uh, right. a news reporter, has, has uh, subsequently did a report that showed what it looked like. But as I was reading this, I thought, oh my goodness, it's like the Middle Ages. People it are is. naked. People Completely are li naked. living in very cold conditions. Right. Uh, at the time when you were there, not even a, a blanket sometimes. Right. Uh, Five and six people in cells built for two. And people on medication who uh, were thirsty and the water system didn't bring drink out of the toilet. The mistake we may make is we say, oh, that's Miami, how terrible, they're so backward. They're, I can tell you there are jails uh, across this country where this is common, very common. Well, at one point, I haven't followed up on it, but at one point there was a report that talked about Montana and Idaho right. being and I'll tell you the other, the places. real problem you have is most jails, I'm talking jails now, not prisons, but most jails don't have facilities for people with mental illness, so they're kept in total isolation, often stripped naked and put in a dark cell and left alone hour after hour, day after day after day, simply because they don't know how else to handle them. Yeah, you mentioned in your book one person was there for 30 days and nobody knew. Yeah. It's, uh, what was the most surprising thing to you as you researched this story? Was it this trans institutionalization which you're talking about, where people are just kind of uh, the jails basically right. have become the, the new asylums? I, I think it's initially I was shocked that we were still treating people this way. I mean, these are human beings. And then when I got to know the people in there, it really became even more heartbreaking. I mean, one of the people that was in there uh, was an, a woman who was psychotic on the streets who'd shoved an elderly woman uh, by a bus stop. And she was charged with felonies. And she'd spent 1,513 days just going back and forth between the jail and the hospital, not getting better, not getting treatment, but being made competent enough to be put on trial so she could be put into a, a prison. And when I found that out, I went over and said, yeah, this woman's for three years, she's been sitting in this jail. And they said, we're gonna keep her for five. That's the longest we can keep her. There are no services out there. We can't release her. She's a threat to the community, but there's no place for her to go. So when I read your book, I had a sense of deja vu. Yeah. Because when I the documentaries that I produced were in 99, 2000, right. you were working on this book in right. 2005. Um, we've had high profile right. instances of uh, shootings lately. Right. People have been talking about this issue for a long time. What's happening? You know, I think we're, we may be at a tipping point, but if you look historically at it, you're going to get depressed because your documentary could go out and be shot again right now in Idaho. Now, uh, I did not see a ninth floor, right. by the way, like that. No, but, but I what, mean the situation of having to be in imminent danger. Right. Well, look, you got um, Navy Yard shooter uh, just a few months ago in Washington, D.C. You got Craig Deeds and his son. What's interesting is those get a lot of attention, but what people often miss is that in both those cases and in the Virginia Tech, in Tucson, people were trying to get help. They couldn't access the service. So the Navy the Yard shooter, point? the tipping point may be Newtown. 
which is kind of ironic because nobody's really quite sure what was going on there with the mental health thing. But that got people so outraged, the killing of children and the building of this. So we have a White House summit. The question is, are we really going to do anything? Now, there's legislation that's boiling around and all this, but what it all boils down to is money. And that's what it's really all about and how the money is going to come down. Now, I'm, um, you know, I'm optimistic in Idaho. You guys are doing some good things. The, like? Like, for instance, you have crisis intervention training. You have, uh, right here in Boise, you have a mental health court. And those usually often go hand in hand. Now you're going to set up these three crisis centers if it per passes. Perhaps. The question is, and a crisis center is really great, instead of taking somebody to jail or prison, and I can cite you the figures, right here in your state with your 700 inmates in prison, you could be saving $13 million just by getting them out of there and putting them, getting them crisis, diverting them from jails and prisons. The question is, all these things are great, but they don't work if you don't have community services. And traditionally, that's what we don't fund. We don't like to put money into those kind of programs. And nationally, we're trying to change that. A uh, very unpopular thing called Obamacare would make a big difference in that. How Medicaid, you have to look at where the money goes to understand. And the, one of the problems, there are two problems. You got me started here. There are two problems. One is we don't look at the whole system. You can't just put a, expect your Department of Mental Health Services to solve this problem. This is a housing problem. This is a jobs problem. This is a transportation problem. People with mental illness need wraparound services that can help them become taxpayers. They can work, they can recover, they can do all these great things. And, and you have to provide those kind of services if you want people to succeed. The problem is that politicians care about two things, votes and money, and mental health has never been a big vote getter or big money. Now we're making some steps and you're doing it in Idaho because you're gonna save money by getting people out of jails and prisons. If this if this flops, passes, yeah. yeah it goes so, through. so you think Newtown was a tipping point? Uh, I think nationally, it's, it's scared as we speak. People, it's over a year up. since then, and yeah. you know, uh, there haven't been. Well, we had a White changes. House conference. We'll see mm -hmm. if that does any good. And we <laughs> Let, we do have legislation. Tim Murphy out of has introduced inter, uh, uh, legislation right. that's pretty dramatic. Uh, the White House has so introduced you'd, legislation. You'd like to see modern asylums, essentially modern facilities where people can go for longer than say no you days. know I hate to I'm not even going to touch that word because it's con it's got the connotation is just so awful in our country it's interesting I've been to other countries where asylum still is seen as a pay place where people can right. go get what I'd like to see is a system community based so that people can live in their communities but provided with the care they need now the question is can you provide that level of service to people who are extremely, extremely sick. In Fairfax County, Virginia, we have a facility where the sickest of the sick are, and each one has 24-hour nursing care. There are eight of them, and the eight um, uh, consumers, people who have mental illness, in that house. And each one of them has a person who stands by them basically 24 hours because they are so psychotic and so sick. Is the public willing to pay for that? That's the question. And uh, before we, r r time is running out, and I want to talk about your son as we wrap up, but before that, guns. Yeah. Your thoughts on, uh, you know, I, I've talked to somebody recently, for instance, there are questions now being asked at the doctor's office. I guess it's a new federal thing about, are you, do you feel like you're depressed? Things like that. I talked to one lady who actually works in a, in a physician's office, and she said, I have a lot of guns. I'm on medication for anxiety. There's no way I'm going to tell anybody because the next thing they're going yeah. to come in and they're going to take my guns. I don't even like so. talking about guns, but uh, you brought up it, it's the fear. The, when this, something like this happens, we want to make a list of everybody with mental illness. And we want to say, okay, we got to get guns out of their hands. Well, did you know that 40% of the first responders to 9 11 suffered post traumatic stress disorder, which is a, a mental illness? Now, are you going to say that? Police officers can't carry weapons. What if a guy's going through a divorce who's a who's a uh, um, a police officer and he says, "Gee, I'm depressed." Are you going to go? Oh my God, we got to get a gun away from him. Now, that's why I don't even like to talk about the whole gun issue because I think it makes it murky. What we don't need to do is make more list of people and and say, "Oh, gee, we got to do that." We need to provide them services so they don't reach the stage where they need to pick up a gun. Let's talk about your son. Okay. Um, he has gone on 
to do well yes, and be an advocate in his own right. Yep. He's even made a, a video that is on YouTube. We'll link to it. Let's listen to a clip from that right now. This is my testimony. This is my praise. This is the receipt for everything that I gave. This is when I was committed, I couldn't behave. This is how I recovered, this is how I was saved. This is my testimony, this is my brave. This is the receipt for everything that I gave. This is when I was committed, I couldn't behave. This is how I recovered, this is how I was saved. I could be anyone in your family tree. When you see your brother, your uncle, you see me, I couldn't be. Who I am today without community housing and opportunity is all part of recovery. One in four adults deal with some sort of form of mental illness in their lifetime. It's the new norm, still it's hard to get support when your mind feels like it is at war and you're inside a psych ward. So I speak out to the people I can reach, teach about mental illness. Each story is unique. I'm not ashamed of everything I've been through. It's not in vain, even if the struggle must continue. It's not a game. This is my brave. This is my life, a tidal wave This is the light that shines the way a brighter day I know for everything I gave I've got a price to pay This is my redemption song, I can't blame society It's a lot there Yeah, there's a lot there and he's come a long, long way And you know, I, there was a time when I thought he'd be homeless He'd be in prison or he'd be dead And he's doing great And it taught me that people can recover and most people can recover if you give them the help they need to recover. And that's the real lesson you got to learn here. We've turned our jails and prisons, our asylums. We're, we're leaving people to die on the street. And we don't need to because most people can't. It's not a question of not knowing what to do. It's a question of we're not doing it. You said writing this book helped save you as well. It did. It turned me, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it turned me into an advocate. Uh, and I make no apologies about that because when you see how people in this country are treated with mental illness, you have to act. And I think as a journalist, you have to act because it's just wrong. So we have about a minute left for those people watching who think that this is happening in their family. What should they do? Well, the first thing they should do is contact National Alliance on Mental Illness. It's strong here in Idaho. Uh, they can tell you what services are available. Have hope. Uh, like I said, I, I didn't think my son would ever be where he is now. And now he's a peer-to-peer -peer specialist. He actually goes in like Alcoholics Anonymous has people who have mentors. He goes in and helps people. Again, we have the tools. It's just we don't want to pay to use them. And until it affects your family, uh, you don't get it. And somehow, with help like you and programs like this, we got to wake people up. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Pete Early. He is a well-known uh, book author, his book, Crazy, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and is about his son who has mental illness. We'll link to information about Mr. Early and services for those with mental illness on the Dialogue website. Be sure to check that out. I'm Marsha Franklin for Dialogue. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.